Welcome to episode two of season five of the Tapping Into podcast. This podcast is sponsored by All Virum, an award-winning cult beauty and well-being brand steeped in ritual, powered by nature, focused on self-care and finessed by science. All Virum is the Latin word for true oil and their hero product is their bath oil. This is a special oil. I didn't realize how powerful it was the first time I used it and my bathroom and bedroom carried the aroma until the next morning. Now I am much more sparing with my pour. The complex fragrance carries notes of eucalyptus, lavender, lemon, lime, Siberian fir needle, juniper and geranium and more. This really does work on mind, body and soul. In this episode, Kate talks about how much she relies on her bath to help her process her grief. And this oil really would support anyone feeling overwhelmed and exhausted of carrying it all. If you too would like to feel relaxed, restored and renewed, thanks to all Virum, Tapping Into Podcast listeners can receive an exclusive 20% discount using the code Tapping for Mums. Just visit allvirum.com. Welcome to episode two of season five of the Tapping Into Podcast. This episode covers a topic that can sometimes be hard to navigate and discuss. So this comes with a trigger warning as we discuss sudden death, widowhood and also child loss. Kate Marilat was my EFT practitioner back when we lost our daughter Alice and she helped me so much. I mean I wouldn't be here today chatting to you now if it wasn't for Kate. Unfortunately Kate went on to suffer the tragic loss of her husband back in May 2020 And this episode discusses the grief journey and how tapping and other tools have really helped her put one foot in front of the other. Kate is co-author of Transform Your Beliefs, Transform Your Life, EFT Tapping Using Matrix Room Printing, a book that I used so much after our sessions and inspired me to become a practitioner and a trainer. She's also written a fiction book and is writing another book about her experience now too. Kate is an amazing ally for EFT practitioners, launching an online community called The Tapping Collective. So you can find out more about that at tappingcollective.com or katemarillat.com or follow her on Instagram forward slash Kate underscore Marillat. That's M-A-R-I-L-L-A-T. In my opinion, this was such a brave conversation for Kate to have. I'm so grateful to her for sharing her experience with us. I know it's going to resonate with some of you in different ways and I hope you find it helpful. Sending so much love to those of you who are navigating grief and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi Kate, thank you so much for coming on to season five of the Tapping Into podcast. Oh thank you, I'm really excited to be here, it's great to see you again. Oh it really is, it's been a while hasn't it and so much has changed for both of us in that time and firstly I just wanted to say a huge thank you Thank you for coming on and for sharing your story with us today, because I know, you know, at times that might not be easy. Um, Mm. And then also want to be a big thank you for, oh my God, I'm getting teary (laughs) already. I was like, I should have been already. (laughs) Me too. Um, Yeah, for saving my life is what came into my head. (laughs) Oh, you did the work, Sarah. Yeah, but I mean, you guided you guided with all your expertise and knowledge and training and yeah yeah I mean Jesus I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you like we wouldn't be doing this Mm. so yeah you might be the one that got away that I'm now able to thank in person (laughs) oh well you know thank you as well it was an you know I think as practitioners we have these sessions sometimes where you're like it splits you open too and it's incredible and you know the energy was was so potent and you know you you brought that and you were ready and yeah mm. it was um a real honor to be to to be the guide dog you know like, <laughs> to be in that room with you as you as you processed so yeah yeah well god it's like completely changed the trajectory of my life you know like that was um nearly eight years ago you know it's coming up to eight years eight years wow yeah crazy um so yeah huge thank you for that so you obviously were in the tapping environment long before me so tell me a little bit about 
what brought you to tapping? Where were you and how did you even hear about it? Oh, yes. Well, I found tapping through a writing group, funny enough, because I was writing a novel and it said, come and learn about the emotional sides of being a writer. And I thought, I think I need this. I'm, <laughs> I'm a very emotional person. I often think, how did that happen? And so I went along to this group and I, I thought, I tried this mad tapping thing. At the time, I was driving a big BMW, working in a corporate job, smoking 20 a day, like a, lo- a whole host of trauma and addictions behind me and, um, and with me at the time. And I found it and I was like, I went home to was then my boyfriend who became my husband I was like I've just found this thing and it it just kind of works and I feel a bit different and I'm not quite sure but you know what it it worked for me I was just I was like this works for me so I I trained in 2009 I think um and I just like most people find that tapping is the thing that they love you're like, wow, I can use it for hay fever and I can use it for that trauma. And I was a great student, you know, I just really went at it. There's a personal priest procedure where I just listed out all of the things that I'd been through in my life and did all my swaps. I just loved it. And, um, you know, it, it helped me have my two boys. I had home births, natural births with them. And I completely credit that to tapping and matrix re-imprinting. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it prepared me very well for the birth, but I think nothing prepares you for the for the parenting side of it yeah Um, so yeah it was it was then and then I had because I always used it for writing and um you know I've been working as a copywriter and then as a practitioner and writing has always been my jam it's just what I love to do it's kind of how I make sense of my brain sometimes in the world and I was just lucky and I call, 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 call it divine intervention, call it luck, call it what you will. But our teacher, Carl Dawson, he was like, you know, I'd really love to write the next Matrix re-imprinting book with you. And I had been trying to manifest a book deal at that point <laughs> for about <laughs> two years, I think. And I nearly, I mean, I started hyperventilating, I think. <laughs> um, so it was a real gift because I worked with him for a year. We wrote it together. We it's called transform your beliefs transform your life it's all about the belief system and all about the field of consciousness actually all about working with your past selves your future selves and kind of evolving and understanding yourself as a human so I was really lucky because the one thing I love about tappers and the tapping community is we're really there for each other Mm. you know there's so many when you get a group of tappers together you know this there with your trainings and the work you do yeah magic isn't it (laughs) (laughs) and the group level work Mm. almost some in some ways feels deeper because it's like a a collective release a collective sigh and yeah you really feel it it, Mm. like intensely in a group yeah yeah so doing I started running sort of big online swap events for practitioners to swap together and then I was doing um, matrix collective consciousness so we were doing different themes and working in the field of consciousness and then we did I did a past lives course and a a create your groups course and I just love putting groups of tappers in a room together you know whether they're beginners or advanced and just seeing where it goes and like you saying have that collective sigh and it just gives you so much of a, I want to say buzz, but it just gives you so much healing as the space holder as well, I, I find. Yeah, and you you really taught me how to hold space because I went to many of those things. It was part of your kind of soul circle okay. um, and at the beginning. And I was in a group of um, uh, some lovely women from all over the world. I think it was Canada, Germany, UK. Yeah. Um, and various ages but I definitely think I was the youngest um I think they felt like I was the daughter of the group and Mm -hmm. that gave me you know a lot of practice in holding this space so each week we take turns and you know I don't think necessarily would have jumped to do that unless I'd had um that level of practice and so you are amazing at supporting the tapping community in that way Well, I just think having spaces where we can practice Mm. is so important. And whether even people listening to this and they've just found tapping, practicing is essentially is where it's at, you know, 10 minutes to start there. And then practicing for the different levels of tapping that you want to do. 
um, like you did, like space holding and, and holding it for a group. So I think that, um, yeah, groups is where it's always been at for me. And then mm. started running the Tapping Collective, which um, which was the Soul Circles was part of that. Yeah. And it's still going. We have, you know, beautiful members and we hold space every month. Um, and then lockdown. So yes. Then lockdown happened. So that was 2020. So mm -hmm. you know, tapping away, working probably more than I should, if I'm honest, you know, work's always been a safe place for me. So I found lockdown, like most people, incredibly hard. Nigel and I had, we've been married about 10 years by that point. And with two boys, we had two boys that were five and uh, almost nine at the time, yeah. Kieran and Seb. And I, I was running a tapathon. Do you remember the tapathon? Like, we, yeah, it's, it's still available actually. If anyone wants to look at that, and it was <laughs> a big charity event for twenty-one days, where we had trainers from all over the world, and they do twenty minutes tapping for twenty-one days live. And we were raising money money for Medicine Sans Frontier Red Cross, and you know, it kept me busy, kept me out of the house, actually. I was in my office and I'd be doing that, mm -hmm. back in and parenting. And, and Nigel was finding it tough um, being out of the office. He was very much, uh, really liked to his routine. He was very, loved, loved his routine. So, so yeah, May 2020 came mm -hmm. and, you know, however much work you've done, whether you've helped people through, deep grief trauma which I've done for over a decade nothing will ever prepare you for you know essentially being with somebody as they die very suddenly of a heart attack so that is what happened to my husband in the middle of lockdown in May 2020 and you know even now it's ineffable to be able to describe it because it was so traumatic and mm, yeah it, it really was it, and there's no other, and it it is and was and will always be sad that he you know died at 48 47 I always get that wrong terrible with numbers mm -hmm. um sorry night um but yeah it, it's just yeah I mean so like yeah. I mean yeah these we both have had our levels of grief and mm -hmm. they've both been really unexpected and shocking and heartbreaking. And like you say, no matter what work you've done in the past prior to that, mm -hmm. um, well, I certainly had, hadn't done any work. <laughs> um, that is unbelievably, you know, rock bottom, yeah, heartbreaking moment. And mm -hmm. how, like, what went through your mind in those first hours or days well I'll, I'll tell you something that I, I'm not sure if I've spoken about this before in fact I think this is the first time I've been the interviewee about this so it's <laughs> quite interesting to, to be on the other side of it but so this may be a bit triggering for people to hear but when Nigel died and I was giving him CPR and I removed the children from the room and it was the same sense of when I had given birth, actually. There was this same chasm opening up around me. And I had a sense of about three versions of me being with me. And they were holding my shoulders and they were tapping on me. And I had this very out of body. Even now my body is just like, mm. it was out of my body a little bit. And I remember thinking... I'm in an alternative reality. I don't, I mean, obviously I was in shock and trauma, but I could feel myself around myself, looking after myself, and I could feel my grandmother there. And, you know, I'll get on to how, how that kind of manifested a bit later. But I, I do remember at the time thinking, this is very strange, I'm going, like watching myself and feeling myself and being there, like all the different versions of myself. I, I could hear myself saying to myself, the things I say when I'm tapping, like, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Like, you know, there's so much love. There's so much love. And, you know, and then we went through 
the whole trauma of it. And you're in complete disbelief and shock. No amount of tapping in those first 12 hours is going to like stop that really. No. Um, but I, one thing, another thing I remember is the next day when I finally got some sleep, I woke up and I had what felt like a huge bruise on my forehead. So I physically felt the trauma, like I'd been smacked in the frontal lobe. Oh, like wow. I, I was so like, my God, it's actually physical. So yeah, I remember thinking that, God, that's, looking back now, I can talk about it at the time, obviously, I'm not really thinking very deeply about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then, so what happened about five days afterwards was I rang Carl Dawson, it might have even been three days afterwards, and told him, he was the person I really wanted to speak to, I was like, he, he might have some knowledge for me or understanding about this. And I remember him saying to me, let's get you tapping let's get you tapping like soon as possible and I just was like nothing's gonna bring him back what are mm. you talking about I was so angry then he kept ringing me every day and it'd be like come on and I can't to be honest with you I don't actually know who it was who did it with me now thinking about it but I know it was a trainer God, that's terrible isn't it <laughs> Might well, have been Penny. I know, the thing is, because loads of the trainers stepped forwards, we've got amazing EFT trainers, including yourself, Sarah, who stepped forward and said, Can I help? Can I do a session? You know, I, it's terrible. My mind's gone blank about who it was, but it was one of the community. <laughs> um, and I did go back and tap on myself. So, in, in Matrix Room Printing, what we do is we go back to the, a past version of ourselves and we go and tap on them. And we go and help them in that moment. So in a different reality, there are there's me going through that trauma with me tapping on myself as I doing as I was doing it. And that is why I believe what I felt at the time, mm -hmm. you know, going through that. Um, and I think it's you're in the very alternative reality state. Everything felt like it was in technicolor. I could feel everything much more acutely than I had before all the pain but also weirdly these huge expansive joy moments as well which I wasn't ready for wow. like but in the sense yeah. not joy of like the joy of nature the joy of being alive watching a bird and just crying at the beauty of it because it hurts so much mm. you just feel like you've lost a layer of skin and you you're just so sore so possibly the veil thinned for you in terms of like your connection to yourself and your energy field completely you know and Nigel was very present with me that first well it was like definitely the first seven days I chanted um as a chant I did every day until the funeral that helped you know I had a lot of support I had I was in quite a unique position really because I had this community of tappers and therapists and that I'd you know, created the Tapping Collective and all of a sudden, I mean, this is what, you know, make, makes me quite teary because <laughs> they were really there, mm. you know, they were really there for me and they did sort of group um, tapping sessions for me a couple of times. On your with, behalf. On my behalf. And yeah. I remember one of them, I, I couldn't move off my bed. The energy was so strong because <laughs> I wow. could feel it. And, you know, so as much as it's the worst thing could happen, I still feel incredibly lucky. I still feel incredibly like, oh my God, the support that I had, mm. the love that I had around me, you know, the healing that I had given to me, the the words of wisdoms that were spoke to me, you know, it's- um, All helped. Yeah. All helps, yeah. Um, so you said there you had a really strong connection with Nigel before, you know, those first seven days and I'm sure beyond. And um, what was your review of, of afterlife before mm -hmm. he was then on that side? Mm -hmm. Well, Nigel was Buddhist, so yeah. we shared similar views around that. And I tell you what, the Buddhists, they really know how to be there for you in death. <laughs> and grief they were the ones his community really showed up as well and they can just sit with you through that they held the funeral and yeah so our beliefs around that were around reincarnation that 
energy doesn't die it just changes and transmutes i'm not buddhist but i really love a lot of what they have to say and a lot of their ethos and they've been an incredible community for us and the and for the boys um so i didn't having a belief system around death really helps when you face death you know and we will all we will all lose somebody at some point mm. and you know, it's really worth giving time and thought to what your belief systems are around death and afterlife because it's it's just important to know for yourself, I think. I mean, mine have always been very strong, you know, connections with my grandparents and, um, you know, I've done quite a lot of work around past lives and so it, it feels quite natural for me to still have a very strong connection with Nigel um which which comes and goes now um, yeah it's, it's different now it, it's yeah it's different now but it's still very loving and um I think anything I do whether it's a client whether it's holding a space whether it's talking to someone lovely like you is I will write out my intention I will write out thank you Nigel thank you and mm. I will just express all my gratitude for being here and to help and to help me hold myself and to speak with some grace and clarity and to remember to breathe <laughs> and all of those things so I, I feel like I've got an ally for life actually mm -hmm. and yeah. how long did it take you to get to that place because you know that's certainly where I am with Alice and I think the work you did with me obviously helped but I like you, I had a belief that the soul doesn't die and it continues on in another place. And that um, for me, it's very much, I believe we don't have to hold grief as the connection point with our loved one. For me, it, I was able to turn grief into love and the, the love becomes the connection point so that I don't feel upset when I think or talk about Alice. I feel the love we have for each other. Now, obviously that takes a little bit of time, um, but I, I wanted to move into that space. I, I felt very conscious that I didn't want to hold grief in a way that would hold me back. What were your thoughts on grief before and then I suppose after? Well, I've always just think grief's not linear and it's a cliche, mm. but it's just, I can feel like this today, but yeah. then there'll be other days where I'm, I'm not feeling like that. And I allow myself for that to happen. And I allow myself for it not to be a constant, especially because I'm parenting the boys through mm. their grief. And that touches a different point, touches like a, a, a different rawness that. Yeah. So. Because you're seeing them transition without their father, them get older without their father and, and everything that's missed with that. Um, but I think that for me, it was a lot around rituals of time passing. So I've always celebrated like solstice and Beltane and different Celtic festivals. I don't say always, I mean, in the last seven years or so. Yeah. Um, and even when it was excruciatingly hard, because summer solstice, I always loved summer solstice and I always had fires and, you know, by the moon and it was all very up energy. But the first summer solstice after Nigel passed, I mean, I could barely speak. I was so angry and so upset and so raw and in pain. And just like, how is this, how is time passing? How am I here? Um, so, you know, every day it was, I mean, I remember saying to myself every day, it feels like I, I break and every day I have to put myself back together again. Mm. So, and there will be times like that again in the future, I'm sure, because uh, we just had Nigel's 50th in December. So it was like three months ago. And what I tend to do now is I used to run a bit from the pain of like sitting in the uncomfortable. I'd be like, oh, I've got a bit busy, get everything organized. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I've got some good friends who point this out to me now. <laughs> and, um, and I will take a day or half a day or what I can to prepare myself for the days that I know that are coming. Because I can feel it coming sometimes. I'm like, oh, mm. there's going to be a grief wave. 
sometimes I'm prepared, sometimes I'm not. Um, and sometimes I, I've been so angry with Nigel and, you know, swearing him and seething with anger. And then other times full of love for him. So I, mm. I don't feel it's a constant. I feel mm. it's just tuning into how am I doing today? How, how are we all doing today? What do we need? How do we feel? Check in and work with what we've got that day, I think. Well, that's a lesson in um, surrender and presence, isn't it? In the, the grounded moment. <laughs> yeah. Just letting go, surrendering. Mm. Um, there's a song actually caught by, I always say the name wrong, Isla Nero called Stars. All oh, right. And that is just beautiful. And I would say for anybody really, you know, in deep grief, movement, moving the body, moving, whether it's tapping, dancing, and it doesn't have to be pretty dancing, it could be mm. stopping like crazy on the angry floor. dancing angry yeah. dancing, stomping like five rhythms has saved me multiple times you know dancing and yeah that's no horizontal thinking I got that from Elizabeth Gilbert she's like if you lie in your bed and it's horizontal you know you can either get up or you do something um but horizontal thinking is a no-no <laughs> Sometimes you need it, but in general, trying not to sort of lie down too much with the brain. Just yeah, really. yeah. I tried that early doors. Like um, there was one day I thought, right, I'm just not going to get out of bed today and see how that goes. And I'm going to sit in bed. I'm going to watch some TV. I'm going to eat, eat food. And the next morning, I was like, okay, not doing that again. <laughs> like it was just yeah it was almost created too much space for my mind. And I also tried headspace, which was just terrible because it was silence. And the last thing I needed was silent to be left alone with my own thoughts. Yeah. And that's, sorry, the dog's having a little shake around over there. Um, <laughs> I think that's why tapping's so brilliant if you connect mm. to it, because there's movement in it there's processing in it there's affirmations in it there's words in it mm. you can do it with someone else you can do it in community you know so I think it is an incredible tool for grief and that path and I think you know I've been writing a lot about grief recently and the processing and so you're probably aware of the you know the Elizabeth Kuba Ross the six the five stages of grief yeah, yeah. and so her protege, David Kessler, he's added the sixth stage of grief. There's a great podcast by Brené Brown talking to him about this sixth stage of grief, which is about finding meaning. And mm. he he lost, he was a you know world-renowned grief expert, and his son died. And this is his latest book, is all about that. And him um, being a grief expert and then processing his own grief and what it has taught him and around this sixth stage of meaning and there's something in it that Brené Brown said around that you cannot you can spiritual bypass to the meaning you know you can go that's okay I found meaning in this and it's gonna be okay and there's times I've definitely done that because I mm, don't same I don't yeah. want to feel all that stuff and um it, the, finding the meaning is incredibly difficult uh, dif important and difficult but mm. important but I think it's um yeah really catching and understanding am I just am I what am I doing here what am I trying to avoid and what am I trying to let go of or, or be in service to and when you have your down days and your difficult moments or you're prepping for uh, a milestone that you know is coming what are the tools that you're using to support you in that mm -hmm. well tapping obviously this yeah. is, uh, I do regular swaps with my with my swap partner um and I quite often will do a chunk of work with a practitioner so I might do like six sessions with one practitioner on a particular um element that I want to work with so the other thing that's really got me through is baths, <laughs> baths <laughs> honestly um we moved so I moved house I decided I couldn't stay in that house um 
anymore. It was just too, it was too much. I wanted to move. And that, that was hard actually a year afterwards. Mm. That was, I think it took me about a year to integrate that move. Um, but I, I got into the house. House needs quite a lot of work, but I was like, first things, getting a bath in because it's been, I'd say one of the most healing things I've done in the last three years is salt baths, flower petals, essential oils, the chance on, close the door, candle light. I mean, I'm Pisces, so I'm all about the water anyway, but <laughs> a cocoon, you know, for me, it's just creating this cocoon. And for me, it's a, a, a sacred space. A place, ritual, yeah. Ritual. So I do it twice a week minimum. Kids are asleep. Bedtimes often have, you know, historically been difficult. Um, so yeah it's like all is quiet I can regulate my nervous system I can be with myself and just you know put a chant on or sometimes just watch tv you know it doesn't need to be too, super sacred all the time yeah yeah relaxing it needs to you know regulating the nervous system is kind of the thing that gets me through so that's salt water now so that's by bathing but also sea swimming lucky enough to be by the sea and my community so me showing up and there's been times that I've shown up in circle and just been you know pretty done in and but actually it's been very healing to to be part of that and to be part of the circle not just holding a circle um yeah so those things um there's definitely others yoga I do actually do quite a lot of weightlifting now um because I love the feeling of being strong I like my muscles to feel strong um and being in nature so it sounds like you know being in nature but so we got a puppy in the October so it's before Covid um Luna her name is and yeah we got a puppy Nigel and the boys had worked on me for two years to get home because I really didn't want a dog. I was like, listen, I'm, I'm the one that's home all the time. You know, mother load, more responsibility. I'm <laughs> sure I can do it, guys. Never really wanted a dog. But Nigel, he was actually quite scared of dogs, but he was so determined that his boys, because Kieran had been jumped on by a dog and had been a bit fearful. He was so determined, like, I don't want the boys to be scared of dogs. We're going to get a dog. It's going to be really good for us. We live by the sea. We all, none of neither of us had a dog before. I mean, we did not know what we were doing. But so he died in the May. So I, I had a seven month old puppy as well as the two boys. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. And no, and no family around. It was COVID. No one would come visit, you know. So it was intense. And don't get me wrong, I did have friends and my family did come when they could. Yeah. Um, but we, I had a walk that I would do every day with Luna and I did it for a year. It's basically a lap round by the cliffs and I would play Nigel's music and I would listen to some of his favourite songs. And sometimes your heart would be so split open with love and connection. Other times you'd just be sobbing and processing as you, as you walk. So Luna is, you know, going on that same walk and watching nature change, watching the seasons change for that whole year was, um, yeah, really incredibly healing, more than I think I know actually mm. doing that walk and having that time alone, the sea and the sky and, you know, watching Luna and trying to stop her barking at everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would say those tools, for me um I mean it's kind of different for the boys because they need different things mm. um a lot of ritual a lot of um you know tuning into where they're at and what they need um yeah. will they um engage with the tapping so yeah my eldest not anymore because mm. he's you know hit hit kind of puberty teenage grief transitioning and it's like no mm. uh, my youngest sure occasionally he will um actually there's been times he'd tap on me um which so in the early days you know bedtime because Nigel died at, at night bedtime is like difficult oh yeah 
and there would be times I would just be you know in their bedroom with them just lying on the floor tapping and crying you know trying to get the strength to parent and mother and there were some dark times in that you know just just doing my all I could do was tap really all yeah. I could do was, and it wasn't that the words were coming it was just tapping and trying to keep myself regulated enough to hold them and to you know get them into bed really um I can't even imagine how hard that would be yeah my god I mean it feels like a lifetime ago now yeah um and I think because where I've seen them go through different stages of the grief process so anger key one right yeah All these, my boys are very physical we do a lot of jujitsu we're very into physicality my eldest especially anger wow like mm -hmm. so even though he won't tap I will tap on myself for him so it's basically surrogate tapping do you want to explain that actually because I've not covered that yet in the podcast oh. at all it's not come up yeah yeah actually it's been incredible for the, for the boys not just from my perspective so Amazing. surrogate tapping is so say for example you've got your child is dysregulated. They don't want to tap in front of you. They're like, you know, whatever age, just throwing stuff. They're stomping their feet. I'm so angry. And depending on the mood and depending on your mood, you can just tap through the points and be like, <sighs> so you can do it two ways. You can be like, I can see you're really angry. All that anger you're feeling. Oh, all that anger. Where's that anger? So you can keep it as a conversation. Sit in your tummy. Oh, okay. I wonder what color it is. Oh, it's red. Okay, all oh, that big red anger in your tummy. Should we stomp it around all the red anger and get them to move, blow it out. Just very simple language. Just blow out that anger, breathe it out. Go on, breathe it out, shake it out. So that's one way you can do it. The other way is, because that would annoy my eldest a lot. <laughs> I would just be saying it in my own head. Mm -hmm. I would just be saying, oh, all the anger you're feeling all that deep anger, all that pain, all that anger. I'm here for you. And like oh. what it does, mm -hmm. it keeps you connected energetically. And I remember a friend of me telling me this when she had three teenage boys that she felt like she was the drain of the house as in not like, as in she was processing like all of the, all of She's the- holding everything for holding everyone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah she was just doing this and just letting it flow through her and um sometimes it can be a bit like that. yeah yeah I suppose you know your nervous system's connected to their nervous system and so if you are using tapping even on yourself in that way you're calming yourself mm -hmm. the connection is then supporting their nervous system yeah 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 and sometimes it it can take five minutes sometimes you need to leave the room calm yourself down a bit mm -hmm. go back in um but just keeping yourself regulated is key really um with dealing with bereaved children and keeping yourself calm and, and modeling believe you me I don't get it right all the time <laughs> I don't want to put myself out here that I'm some perfect <laughs> I'm not. but no. I think just having some knowledge around that's important and knowing is is half is half of it actually going oh okay I need to look at where I'm being a parent or look at how I'm behaving as a child and what do I need to do to calm myself down so I can go back in there with you know a rational mind and a, a calm mind and a calm body and an energy mm. to help them because if you do some 12 deep breaths next to them without saying anything they'll start breathing a bit deeper alongside with you so even if tapping feels like a stretch, just 12 breaths, hand on the heart, 12 breaths. We also did something called um, colour, what do we call? We call it something else like heart, heart colour or something like that. So we'd put our hearts together and I would say, oh, guess what colour I'm sending you? And I would send like pink mm. into his heart and he'd be like, oh, orange or pink and doesn't really matter if he gets it right or not and I'd be like oh what are you going to send me and we would just send each other a bit of color sometimes that was always a nice beautiful with them yeah mm. how like apart from obviously losing your best friend and the love of your life and how how did you manage with the the gap of a partner gone and you know 
it's not, yeah, it's not, um, I think it, it's like your whole identity, you know, you all of a sudden I'm like, I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm a widow. Like I'm not married anymore. Like yeah. what? And, um, the support and the love and, you know, it's, it's huge. It is a huge gap. And that's where I could get quite angry with him and be like, how could you leave us? And, you know, yeah, it's good friends really help good female friends. I have two amazing sisters, lovely parents. Mm. I'm very close to Nigel's family as well. So um, that really, it's one day at a time, mm. one day at a time and not running from the loneliness, but sitting in, in it and finding other ways to process that. Um, in some ways, I'm quite lucky because I've always been quite like a work by myself. I enjoy my own company. And um, I think in a marriage, you know, quite often you want space from each other. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our marriage wasn't perfect. And we, we came together and we were both quite independent people. So we did give each other quite a lot of space. Um, but yeah, the absence of somebody is that you're so closely connected to. Um, it, it just really takes time. And it just takes a lot of grit and a lot of grace and a lot of surrendering. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I just be on the floor in the shower crying, you know, like it is just that it's that raw you just mm -hmm. I don't know if you can get up off this floor but you do because you have to carry on yeah and have you found any form of acceptance over his death um like I said you know it's not it's not linear I definitely mm. definitely am in a place of acceptance and in a place of where and how I can find meaning um, and how, you know, but then there are still sometimes it's like getting a roundhouse kick from Bruce Lee, you know, sometimes it still knocks me and I think, how did this happen? This is not fair, mm. this is not fair. Um, but there, it's, there's so many things in this world that aren't fair, you know, like yeah. that's yeah. what cuts you open every day, you know, is, terrifying things happening all over the world that are not fair I think my world got very small for a while and now it's very much opening up again and yeah you're seeing the injustice and the unfairness of it all and um you can either fight against it or you can accept it surrender and move through it really and the surrender piece I know we say it quite flippantly but like it's freaking hard isn't it and it, like um surrender is like a daily practice and 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 what does it mean like let's explore that because I think a lot of people will be like I don't actually know what you mean like <laughs> what is it so for me surrendering is okay I'm getting taken under now with the emotions that are coming at me I feel like I'm in a sea I'm getting hit by this is just so hard and there are lots of ways we could distract ourselves from that TV, um, shopping, you name it, you know, mm -hmm. a whole host of things we can get. And that's okay for a certain amount. Yeah. But real surrender is <clears throat> getting real quiet with yourself and allowing yourself to feel that pain, mm -hmm. actually because it's not going to go anywhere but if you feel it and you give yourself an hour and you tap or you sit or you light a candle or you pray or you do a yoga practice although yoga can be a distraction <laughs> breathing breathing playing music dancing being in your body it's literally a state I mean if you think of the surrender pose so you're on your knees and your arms are up straight and you're just looking up, your heart is open. Mm -hmm. That's the surrender pose, arms open, I surrender. And actually there's a lot of power in that. I mean, as I say it, you know, can feel it like I surrender, I surrender. Can't do it, I surrender. 
you're gonna have to give me some help here you know like yeah that for me means surrender yeah and like the connection to help connection who are we connecting to there is that our higher self is it god the universe everyone anything 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 <laughs> yeah actually, yeah you know, it actually matter what, what yeah. you believe in no um, no it's just that you're not alone you're not alone with this it can even be a friend you know it doesn't have to be a higher power it can just yeah. be saying I'm surrendering I need some support I need help let me off the floor please and bring me some food so is it the white flag yeah white yeah. flag yeah like okay I'm done I'm done for an hour I think mm. they used to have a fear of like if I sit down if I surrender to this I won't get back up again yeah 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 you know and that's perfectly valid and there were days that I would oh I knew I'm just gonna just gonna store this for a bit because I do need to keep going I've got to get the kids to school I've got to mm -hmm. run some things in the business etc um but it'll it'll come they'll come in the bath it'll come lying down in your bed it'll come mm. and I think it's to just accept that it'll come and it'll go like this too shall pass this too shall pass and yeah the more you do it, the more you trust it. The more you surrender, the more you can trust the process of surrendering and letting go. If you run from it all the time, you're going to be scared of it. I was mm -hmm. scared of it sometimes. But now I do trust it. I think, okay, I've got, I've got to practice my surrender. I've, got to, I've just got to let go. I've got to shake this out. I've got to got to move this through me or just lie down and pray you know yeah and I think it's um letting go of the outcome letting go of the control letting go of trying to change it yeah because that's it's come up for a reason isn't it like the wave has arisen yeah. because it needs to come out yeah otherwise if we're going to carry on which is obviously the beauty in the tapping because you're able to hold the space for that and help it move through the body mm -hmm. but if you ignore and suppress, then the wave's going to come harder the next time, probably. Yeah, real hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. You're just thinking of yourself as, you know, you're going to have these emotions when you've had big trauma and you're dealing with big stuff. The emotions are going to be even bigger. Those waves are going to be even bigger. So it's just thinking of it as, a, you know, energy, emotion, yeah. energy, emotion that it is just needs to come through you and to release. And you're probably going to feel tired afterwards and you're going to need to tread very gently. You know, I was just working with somebody who had been carrying a lot of grief and shame, but a big secret for like 11 years, never told anybody and then disclosed it. And, whew, you know, she was tired and, you know, for a week, really, you know, she mm. felt pretty tired for a week and it's, it's kind of acknowledging, okay, I, I'm, I've just let that move through me now and I can stand a bit brighter and a bit taller and I'm, I've processed that. I'm not alone with it anymore and I can surrender to it now and I don't want to carry that for the rest of my life. I don't want to keep pushing these things down. I want to move it through me because we've only got a certain amount of space to keep pushing stuff down, right? Like... Yeah, yeah, where does it go? Eventually, it's not Eventually. going to be pretty. Mm. It won't be. It will be disease, stress, yeah. illness. It will be all of those things which burnout. We don't want. <laughs> we yeah. really don't want. So just feeling it is and surrendering and, and moving through is is the best way, really. Yeah, and I feel like surrender equals compassion. You know, like you have to give yourself absolute tons of compassion through through this and and love yeah real love real compassion mm. real care um and I think you know I've always been quite tough on myself like oh you need to do this you need to do that and yeah compassion is definitely part of that like going you can't operate like that anymore you're gonna have to change tactics you're gonna have to try a different way yeah I imagine your um like I obviously don't know what your self-love you know views were beforehand but like you probably have to really dig deep now to support yourself because you don't have the other person there necessarily to kind of boost you or to pick you up 
you've got to almost do that for yourself. Yeah, you do. Um, I think friends can do it, family mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, yeah, I often find it really in the body, actually, like real kind of like rubbing the heart and just kind of like giving myself a little tap on the heart and saying, it's OK, you've got this. Um, but yeah, so I mean, self-compassion, this is a lifelong journey, really. And yeah, everyone, yeah, everybody, everybody <laughs> yeah. that self-compassion. Um, but getting to know yourself as well is part of that, you know, knowing where do you need that compassion? How do you need that compassion today? Is it a bath? It might not be, it might be going out for a run. Is it seeing a friend, you know, is it going out dancing? So it's kind of connecting into like, it not always being the same thing and what yeah. you need on different days. Um, sometimes doing a big tapping session isn't what you need. Like going through the trauma again, isn't what you need. What you need is, to go and visit an art gallery and do some writing you mm -hmm. know like yeah I think um I used to bury myself a lot in work and I definitely don't do that as much anymore um I sort of was on a bit of a mission around healing the nervous system for a, a year or two and yeah it's that is the compassion really just kind of showing up for yourself every day and knowing you know for me it's like well they've only got one parent so I have to make myself as strong and as healthy and as regulated as possible for them because there is only yeah. and I think yeah. that's kind of the core the thing that drives me through a lot absolutely that's a good motivator isn't it yeah yeah um and where are you now um what have you been working on you said you're doing a lot of writing about grief talk to us about that yeah so I've been well I've got two books coming out actually not just one so yeah I've got a novel that is called Heartbeats and that I started writing five or six years ago so this was something I was writing before Nigel passed yeah and even now it gives me a little bit of kind of that tingle because it's the story of um, a man receiving a heart transplant from a woman um, it's all, and her heart is still attached to her soul oh my goodness <laughs> all of her journey and his journey as a single father and their grief and the power of the heart oh my god okay. <laughs> so <gasps> it's been quite the thing to write for the last few years um, it's been extremely healing a space to write about grief through characters mm. um, and it goes through Paris and Greece as well so it's a lot it's a very foodie book actually he like he loves he rediscovers his love of um, making croissants so he's off in Greece and then he goes to Paris I lived in Paris for six months so it was a beautiful thing to write in that oh, sense wow. because there was so much sensuality and, and being in those places when you're in lockdown, you can go there in your head and enjoy it, enjoy it through the characters. So yes, can't tell you exactly when, but it looks like it'll be next year at the moment. Um, and the other one, I won't say too much about because it's fairly new, but essentially mm -hmm. it's a lot about the stages of grief and tapping and other things that can help. But yeah, I'm just at the moment, I'm still in a hanging it up kind of phase, writing bits and seeing where it all moves around and will hang together. But yeah, those are the two Exciting. things coming out in the next 18 months or so. Yeah. yeah, well, I feel, you know, for me, taking my experience and sharing it and writing about it at the time and then going on to support women in the similar way that I was helped and you know that was all part of supporting me in making and uh, making sense of it um and giving it that yeah that that meaning even if there was a bit of bypassing going on <laughs> um it certainly helped um so I can imagine that taking this and all the tools that you've been using and the wisdom you've gathered and all the thousands of people you've already helped and um and writing that into something that people can pick up in a place where they need that help like that's just going to be amazing yeah well it's you know all of us tappers showing up just like you just saying oh you know I want to 
feel a bit different. I want to change mm. how, how I'm showing up. And yeah, just being in community as we do it is so important, I think, as well. So yeah, I think books, I'm always going to write books. I love writing books. So <laughs> there'll definitely be more to come. And yeah, being in the space with other tappers and is is just um, a magic sweet spot for me, really. Yeah, so you're back kind of now, um, are you kind of full time into the collective in that in yeah, that tapping I mean, space? I was really lucky because we've got so many brilliant practitioners, people like Sandra Spencer, who's incredible. And she ran a lot of the group stuff when I was not able to. Um, I'm definitely doing, you know, much more of it now, probably 70% of it now. Mm. Um, and I've started, I knew when I was starting to feel like, okay, I'm ready because I started to take clients on again. So people are really coming to me with the big stuff now, like, you know, it's all, it's always been big stuff, but even now it's even like, okay, like real journey stuff for, you know, we generally work together for about three months and do a lot of ancestral clearing this life, past lives, this life and in the future as well. So it's really about yeah kind of setting where is where we want to go like in our in our energetic sat nav and saying okay well what do we need to adjust to if that's the direction we're going in what do we need to adjust on our maps and where we've come from to help us get there in a with grace and love um so yeah the tapping collective if you want to find out more about that you can just go to tappingcollective.com um i think it's on waitlist at the moment and then you know, you'll be, you'll get my emails and, and see what we're up to around books. And if you want to have a chat with me about, you know, anything that you might want to let go of, you can just reach out to me over there and we can figure it out. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much for your time. I know obviously it's, you know, a very difficult topic to talk about. And I really, really appreciate your help because I have members in my community who are also widows and um, also happened um, in tragic circumstances. So I know that they're going to really appreciate uh, listening to your journey and, and your experience as well. So huge, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. So much love to you. Oh.